In this video, I'm going to be talking about how I didn't find Jesus until after I left the religion of Christianity, and how discovering Jesus outside of the walls of institutionalized religion has transformed me more than anything I've experienced in my life. Now, I don't think religion is bad. I think it can be very useful and helpful and even beautiful. But ultimately, religion is not the end-all be-all. It can point us to truth and lead us into truth, but it alone is not the truth. To me, it's more of a stepping stone for the early stages of our spiritual growth and development. So I think of it as like a vehicle that, if driven properly, can bring us to greater dimensions of spiritual maturity. But again, I don't think of it as a, a one and only belief structure or a creed or a list of doctrines that must be followed in order for one to experience God or get to heaven someday. I think of it simply as something that can serve us well in our spiritual journey early on, but ultimately it must be let go of and transcended. The nest is comfortable, safe, and secure, but if the bird stays in the nest its entire life without learning how to fly and explore the world beyond the confines of the nest, it will never mature into the bird it was created to be. And I believe that something that served you, nourished you, and aided toward your development for a time can eventually become the very thing that hinders you from maturing, growing, and transforming. When religion becomes unhealthy for us spiritually is when it becomes an egoic, tribal, us-versus-them thing where it's all about who's in and who's out, and we think that our group, our denomination, our belief structure is the one and only way, and anyone else who isn't a part of our group or anyone who questions what we believe is ostracized, excluded, and labeled heretical, deceived, or hellbound. This is when religion turns into group narcissism. And group narcissism has never produced any kind of authentic spirituality. And so I think if Jesus came back and found out that a religion was created in his name that was full of division and arguments about who had correct theology out of the infinite ways a holy book called the Bible could be interpreted, uh, I think he would be extremely infuriated and tremendously disappointed. At the core of Jesus's message was love, pure and unconditional love. And this love transcended divisions, categories, and labels. He dined with sinners. He reached out to those in society that were labeled as untouchable, and he showed compassion and inclusion towards them. And he warmly welcomed the outcast by expressing solidarity with them. And in doing so, he revealed that the ultimate essence of spirituality is not found in adherence to a particular set of religious rules, but in how we treat one another. It is a message that calls us to move beyond the barriers we've constructed in the name of faith, disting distinguishing between who's in and who's out. And as we are able to transcend the egoic limitations of such divisions, we open the door to profound spiritual transformation and unity consciousness. And this is when miracles start to happen. So without further ado, here is my story, here is my journey, and here is how I found Jesus outside of Christianity. So I was born, raised, and baptized in the Catholic Church. And just about everyone in my family on both my mom and dad's side were Catholic and they were very devoted practicing Catholics. So I went to Catholic school, and I went through the sacraments of reconciliation and First Communion. And when I was around six, which would have been about a year before I made my First Communion, I began to develop a very deep love for Jesus, the Mass, and the history and tradition of Catholicism. Uh, so much so 
that around this time in my life, around six or seven, I wanted to become a priest when I grew up. Uh, the notion of God, the devil, religion, and the afterlife were always subjects that really intrigued me from as far back as I can remember. Uh, but as the years went on and I got into middle school, I started to lose a little bit of interest in religion. And going to Mass became boring and monotonous. And I really didn't like the feeling of uh, being guilty all the time for not following all the commandments and rituals and rules that were required. And around this time, my mom started questioning some of the beliefs she was raised with in Catholicism. And she just so happened to have some friends who were Protestant. And every now and then, her Protestant friends would invite her to their church events or send my mom the sermon videos from their pastor. And slowly but surely, this led to my mom wanting to leave the Catholic Church. And one day, I decided to watch one of those sermons from a Protestant pastor with my mom. And my 10-year-old self uh, just couldn't believe what I was watching. Someone was talking about Jesus and the Bible who was funny and relatable and entertaining. And I felt like I could listen to this guy all day. And I said, Mom, who in the world is this priest? And why doesn't he have on the priestly vestments? And why does his church look nothing like our church? The people are laughing, smiling, and drinking coffee in the church. I mean, this is awesome. Like, what the heck is this? And my mom began to explain to me that this was a pastor, not a priest, and that he wasn't Catholic like us, but he was still a Christian. And up until this point, I really didn't know much about any other religions or Christian denominations outside of Catholicism. But now I was very curious to learn more about these other churches and why everything about their services seemed so much more fun, entertaining, and captivating. And not long after this happened, my parents decided to leave the Catholic Church. And we started going to an evangelical church, which evangelicalism is a branch of Protestant Christianity. And I also started going to a Christian school that wasn't Catholic. And during this time, I developed a passion for the Bible. And as a Catholic, I learned all the basic Bible stories, but this was the first time I actually started studying the scriptures. And studying the scriptures turned into an addiction to where I was reading the Bible for hours every day after school, after learning about the Bible all day in class at my new Christian school. And by the time I was a freshman, nearly three years after becoming a diligent student of the Bible and learning Protestant theology, I started leading my first Bible study, which just so happened to be about eschatology, which is the study of the end times, because my favorite book of the Bible was Revelation. And Revelation was one of the first books I started studying and learning about when I became an evangelical. And then by the time I was a senior, I decided that I wanted to go into ministry full time. And so my senior year of high school was completely dedicated to this calling. And I began to do street evangelism. I was leading multiple Bible studies. I was attending prayer services with local ministries. I was speaking and teaching at local ministry events and at churches and at schools. And I was serving regularly at my church. The next step for me in fulfilling my dream of becoming a pastor in full-time ministry was to go to Bible college. So after graduating high school, I enrolled at one of the most prestigious evangelical Bible colleges in America, where I would earn a bachelor's degree in theological studies with a concentration in ministry. But during my freshman year at this Bible college, I started wrestling with some of the core tenets of my evangelical faith that I had been taught for the past eight years of my life. What really prompted these doubts and questions I had was right before I started my freshman year, I decided to do an in-depth study on church history, which was something I had never really looked into before. 
And during this study, I discovered that some of the main beliefs I had about God, the Bible, Jesus, salvation, sin, heaven, hell, the afterlife, and the end times were mostly doctrines that came about many centuries after Jesus and the apostles were on the earth. And from this, I realized that some of the core beliefs I held as a Protestant and evangelical were relatively new in church history, dating back only a few hundred years. This meant that Jesus, the apostles, and the church fathers had not taught these ideas, and for nearly 1,500 years, many of these theological concepts were completely absent from the church's teachings. Doing the church history study led me to discover that for about the first few centuries after Jesus was on the earth, Christianity was not an established religion as we know it today. Before then, it wasn't called Christianity and it wasn't a religion. It was a movement called the Way. The Way were followers of Jesus who, above all else, centered around love, unity, compassion, humility, equality, and generosity. And as they would meet regularly for fellowship and meals in houses, not church buildings, they were always looking out for each other, making sure everyone had enough to eat and enough supplies for the rest of the week. The followers of the way were passionate about caring for those experiencing poverty and for the orphans and for the widows and for the sick. They spent their lives caring for those in need and spending time with those who were excluded, marginalized, neglected, and forgotten about by society because they recognized, as Jesus did, that we all share in a common humanity. And even though we can't always perceive it and see it, we are one. We are all connected. So loving your neighbor as yourself, which was the top priority of the Jesus movement called the way, was essentially the recognition that by loving, serving, caring for, and giving to others, you are simultaneously loving, serving, caring for, and giving to yourself because we are all interconnected, not separated. The sacred presence within your neighbor is no different than the sacred presence within yourself. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus adamantly prayed to the Father that the world would wake up to the reality of this union. Jesus would often talk about how when you take care of those in need, especially the least of these, you are doing it to him. And this is why the followers of the way centered their entire lives around sacrificial, selfless, unconditional love and compassion for all people. And this love for humanity was very universal and very inclusive. But then in the fourth century, the Roman Emperor Constantine took the Jesus movement and turned it into a religion that would become the religion of the state. And from this point on, the movement of the way started by Jesus that was centered around sacrificial love, freedom, grace, inclusion, solidarity with all human beings, compassion for those in need, and radical generosity was now transformed into a formalized institution with established doctrines, rituals, and hierarchies becoming what we now know today as Christianity. Besides doing the in-depth church history study to find where some of the core doctrines of my faith truly originated from, the second thing that really compelled me to question my Christian beliefs was how when I looked at the life of Jesus, I saw someone who was trying to unify humanity despite all of the differences humanity had, not divide them. Jesus spent so much of his time hanging out with people that his religious tradition considered to be the outsiders, unclean, and excluded from God. But what I noticed was that every time Jesus encountered someone outside of his religious tradition, he didn't attempt to convert them to his faith or to his tradition. Instead, he just expressed unconditional love 
and he provided healing and he show he offered deliverance and he showed care without any conditions or expectations. Jesus believed that pure love could unite the world, emphasizing love over proselytism. He didn't engage in the game of identifying who was included and who was excluded. Instead, he demonstrated solidarity by spending time with and supporting those whom his tradition and society considered to be lost and disconnected from God. And through his actions, he conveyed and revealed that they were inherently included, accepted, and loved simply by virtue of being human. The more I encountered such instances in the Gospels, the more apparent it became that the methods of ministry and evangelism in which I was being trained bore no resemblance to this approach. As a Christian fundamentalist, we were instructed to unify people by encouraging them to align with our particular branch or denomination of Christianity and to join our church and to persuade them that our perspective and our biblical interpretation and our doctrine was the one and only truth. But after really taking a step back and examining the, this approach of evangelism, what really struck me was that not only did this approach differ significantly from Jesus's approach to unifying people, but it also contained many cult-like characteristics. And as a freshman in college examining my faith, this was starting to really concern me, and I couldn't believe that I had overlooked these characteristics for so long. As I continued on this personal journey of rethinking my faith, I began to closely examine the core tenets I had been told were fundamental and non-negotiable. And as a result of this, my beliefs underwent a significant transformation, leading me to reconsider five fundamental pillars of my Christian faith. Biblical inerrancy, the concept of hell, original sin, the idea of a devil or Satan, and dispensationalism eschatology. And I will be creating a series of videos soon, each dedicated to thoroughly explaining why I no longer believe these doctrines. Now, I didn't change my mind about these things overnight. Uh, for the most part, it took three years of me studying countless hours and reading many books to finally come to the conclusions that I came to going into my senior year. And keep in mind, I was studying all of this in my private time while I was at one of the most prestigious evangelical schools in America. So as I'm studying these different theologies, ideas, and perspectives, which meant studying church history in depth and the scriptures in their original languages, I was simultaneously learning more about my current evangelical belief structure I had at the time and comparing it with these new ideas that I was learning about. So even as I was examining and reconsidering these five doctrines of my faith, I still wasn't totally convinced that I now that I no longer believed them. Uh, convincing myself to actually change my mind about these core beliefs was very challenging, uh, especially after being heavily indoctrinated to think and believe a certain way for nearly a decade. But after putting in all that time to really study these things out, after three years of wrestling with these different ideas and theologies, I could no longer pretend to believe things I no longer believed and ignore all the things I was learning about. And so going into my senior year, I had completely let go of those five doctrines and I decided to write my 35-page senior paper on how hell, as this place of eternal punishment for unbelievers in the afterlife, doesn't exist and how it wasn't really developed and considered a fundamental and mainstream belief as we know it today until centuries after Jesus walked the earth. Writing this paper 
was a huge turning point for me because it was the very beginning of me courageously sharing my new beliefs. And what better way to do it than to write your senior paper as a refute against hell at one of the biggest evangelical Bible colleges in America. Writing this paper is what really sparked my passion to begin writing poetry, blogs, and then eventually my first book, The Mystery in You. And after graduating from college, I started to become very outspoken about my new beliefs, and I started sharing them on social media. And when this happened, just about all of my Christian friends began to panic, and they felt the need to bring me back in line because to them, I was beginning to be led astray. And many of them started to text me and call me and direct message me on social media and ask me things like, what has gotten into me? And asking me why I was posting false teachings and heretical theology. They were deeply concerned and worried about me because to them, my new beliefs were dangerous and deceptive. And I was even accused of not believing the Bible anymore. But my response to this was, no, it's not that I don't believe in the Bible anymore. It's just that I don't believe in your interpretation of the Bible. And it's not that I'm not a Christian anymore. It's just that I no longer subscribe to your branch of Christian fundamentalism. And that's okay. From here, I started to lose a lot of friends and people who I had been in ministry with for years completely cut me out of their lives. People who I had loved and had built great relationships with were now labeling me as a heretic and a false teacher and someone who was influenced by the devil, all because I no longer believed what they believed about the Bible and God. Agreeing to disagree was not an option here. Uh, to them, I was going against the tribe, or flock, as they would call it. And this was all because I was questioning their beliefs and moving on to different understandings, ideas, and perspectives. And the only way I could be forgiven and reconciled back into the club for the horrible sin I had committed for changing my theology and thinking differently was if I completely renounced my beliefs and got back in line with the rest of the group who all believed in the same thing. And if I refused to do this, I would be deemed wrong, heretical, dangerous, and deceived, which basically meant I was jeopardizing my salvation. When I decided that I was going to trust my heart and stand with what I believed to be true, I realized that I would no longer be accepted because of these new beliefs that didn't align with the core tenets of the evangelical church. And so because of this, I decided to walk away from evangelicalism altogether. But this did not mean I was walking away from Jesus. No, in fact, it wasn't until I left the confines of my Christian fundamentalism that I finally discovered who Jesus really was, what he taught, what he embodied, what he stood for, and what he came to reveal as truth. My new beliefs were often labeled as new age and progressive. And the reason I was being considered a heretic by some of my Christian friends was because they believed I was departing from orthodoxy and traditional Christianity. But when I did the church history study back in college, what I noticed was that my new beliefs may have been new to me and may have been new to my Christian friends, but they were not new to the church. My new beliefs actually aligned tremendously with what the early church predominantly taught and believed for the first centuries of the Jesus movement, before the Jesus movement became an institutionalized religion. And on the other hand, my previous beliefs that I was brought up in that were considered to be fundamental and non-negotiable were actually relatively new doctrines and theological ideas that were only prevalent in the church for a few hundred years. But I never knew this until I did the study for myself. Why? Because I had always just trusted the teachings and traditions passed down to me without questioning them. 
And it was only until I did my own personal study and research that I discovered the historical context and evolution of these doctrines and beliefs, which led me to re-evaluate my understanding of my own faith. From the time I was 11 years old, I was taught that this is what the Bible says, and this is the one and only correct way to read the Bible. And I was sternly instructed to believe everything the pastor preached and taught me because they were chosen by God to lead, and they went to seminaries for years, so don't question them. And when you are in a spiritual community with hundreds and thousands and millions of people who all believe the same things, uh, why would you ever think to question the truth? It's a lot easier to just get in line, keep your mouth shut, and follow the leader. But after years of this, I had had enough. I couldn't keep ignoring my heart. I couldn't keep pretending to believe things I knew deep down couldn't be true. And I couldn't continue to remain in a religion that claimed to be following Jesus, yet spent just about all of its time highlighting and clarifying who was in and who was out, who was accepted and who was rejected, who was saved and who was lost, who was going to heaven and who was going to hell. Instead of promoting and leading the way for unity and oneness, it was nothing but division division, and more division. In fact, I remember trying to witness to someone one time who was not a Christian, and the reason he would not convert to Christianity was because he said, why would he join a belief structure that preaches unity from the pulpit, but is in fact the most divided religion in the world, broken up into thousands of different denominations and groups due to different biblical interpretations and theological ideologies. And then he asked me to explain why so many of these groups in Christianity disagree with each other and have completely different theologies and doctrines that even sometimes totally contradict one another, yet they each claim that their theology and their interpretation of the Bible is the most accurate because the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. And I had no answer for this person. And it was all of these unanswered questions like this that started to build up over time in my head. And eventually I got to a point to where I was no longer okay with ignoring these things and just sweeping them under the rug. And so at this point, it was time for me to let go. It was time for me to move on, and it was time for me to yield to the pull of my heart that was bringing me into a brand new season of life on my spiritual journey. And little did I know at the time, but this season would be by far the most important and transformative season of my life. But before this transformation came, I experienced a real low point in my life, feeling totally isolated, worried, and afraid of what the future would be like after walking away from the faith I knew to be the one and only true faith for pretty much my entire life. And during this time, I began to yearn for something beyond fundamentalism, beyond dogma, beyond doctrines, beyond institutionalized Christianity. One of the things I remembered from my church history study was reading about the mystics of the church. And a mystic is someone who perceives God to be an infinite mystery that transcends anything our finite minds can fully grasp or understand. So instead of trying to fit God into a rigid theological doctrinal box of intellectual knowledge, the mystic approaches God with an open heart and mind solely to experience divine union. The Christian mystics believed in the profound possibility of experiencing God directly within themselves, recognizing that the divine presence is not confined to external rituals or religious institutions. They believe that God, as the source of all existence, 
fills every aspect of creation and resides within the depths of the human soul. The mystics believe that when we attempt to label and confine God within the narrow boundaries of theological constructs, we inadvertently limit our understanding of the divine. And so instead, they urge us to embrace the mysteries of faith, to surrender to unknowing, and to unlearn preconceived notions. And in doing so, they believe that this approach opens the door to encountering God in a way that is indescribable, far beyond the capacity of human constructs and concepts. This idea of embracing Jesus beyond the boundaries of organized religion and experiencing mystical union with God was something that I was very much drawn to during this time in my life. And as I begin to read some of the mystics, such as Julian of Norwich, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, Catherine of Siena, Meister Eckhart, Brother Lawrence, and Thomas Merton, I started to experience God directly for the first time within my being, which led me to having a spiritual awakening. Now, what is a spiritual awakening? Well, let me first just say that I know for some people the phrase spiritual awakening can evoke various reactions and skepticism, especially for people who are unfamiliar with it. Uh, During my years of Christian fundamentalism, anytime I heard a word or phrase that had to do with spirituality but wasn't clearly stated in the Bible, I immediately would consider it to be unbiblical, dangerous, and potentially demonic. And now looking back at it, I realized that that was just a lazy way of dismissing alternative perspectives and ideas instead of actually taking adequate time to explore and understand the depths of different spiritual experiences and philosophies. A spiritual awakening, in essence, is the process of breaking free from narrow perspectives to embrace the spiritual truths that exist beyond any one tradition or belief system. It is a journey of unlearning and unknowing to seek a more profound understanding of spirituality and the human experience. It's the recognition that God's presence permeates every aspect of our existence, from the grandest cosmic forces to the tiniest particles of matter. And spiritual awakenings are often triggered by moments of new insight, crisis, or inner turmoil. It can be a sudden revelation or a gradual unfolding, but it always leads to a shift in consciousness. It is a journey inward, a journey to the depths of our being, where we encounter the divine essence that has always been within us. It's not a matter of gaining something new. Rather, it's about acknowledging and wholeheartedly embracing what has always existed, what has always been true. And this awakening is not reserved for a select few or for the spiritually elite. It is a universal invitation, a call to all beings to awaken to their true nature and to live in harmony with the divine presence. It is a call to love, to compassion, and to service. And when we recognize the presence of God within ourselves, we cannot help but see it in others and in the world around us. Meister Eckhart said, The day of my spiritual awakening was the day I saw and knew I saw all things in God and God in all things. Jesus' mission was to lead us into the realization that God dwells within us and is in all creation. He called us to fully embrace this truth with open arms and to live from this divine center within and to become instruments of love, healing, and transformation in the world. This, my friends, is the heart of the gospel message. The gospel is not a mere transactional agreement with God where one follows a set of rules or beliefs in exchange for salvation. Uh, Jesus embodied a totally different narrative than this, 
one that echoed throughout his teachings and actions. His mission was rooted in the profound, liberating truth that God's love is relentless, boundless, and inclusive. It is through Jesus that we find that the gospel is a transformative journey of awakening to the reality of God's love, not a transaction for securing a spot in some distant paradise. <laughs> the heart of the gospel message is that the divine is not an angry judge waiting to condemn but a loving creator inviting us to participate in the ongoing story of redemption, renewal, and unconditional agape love. It is a beautiful, life-giving, and liberating message that invites us to live with open hearts, open minds, and open hands, embracing the love and grace of God and sharing it with the world. It is not a list of rules or a doctrine to be defended. It is a story to be lived and a love to be shared. What I just shared with you is my story and my journey. And the path for you may look different and that's okay. My experience with Christianity as a religion growing up is something that I am very thankful for, both as a Catholic and as an evangelical. These seasons of my life were necessary chapters of my journey that enabled me to eventually fly out of the nest into my spiritual awakening, where I came to understand Jesus and the truth that he came to reveal beyond anything I could ever think or imagine. Now, some of you may be saying, yeah, I somewhat agree with what you're saying, but what about this verse? And what about this teaching and this prophecy? And what about all these different things? And to that, I say, stop. Hang tight for a second, because in my next five videos, I will be thoroughly discussing the five main doctrines of the faith that I changed my mind about. And I believe that throughout this teaching series on Biblical inerrancy, hell, original sin, Satan, and the end times, many of your what about questions will be answered and hopefully help you grow in your own spiritual journey. So be sure to stay tuned as part one of this series will be coming out very soon. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.